Dr. Hovind, I love your doctoral thesis. I've torn it to pieces with howls and guffaws. I can't remember when I last pissed myself laughing. It's a good thing the thesis mopped the piss off the floor. Welcome to part 23 of this read-through and peer review of Kent Hovind's doctoral dissertation, which was published on wikileaks.org on December 9th, 2009. If you have not yet seen the previous episodes in this series, then I recommend that you go back and see those first, as, like in previous episodes, I will be starting this episode exactly where I left off in the last. In the last episode, Kent told us all about Karl Marx. In this episode, Kent gets all Alex Jones on us. Let's conspire to uncover the conspiracy. Kent continues, let's go on in the who's who in the evolutionary hall. We will continue in chronological order by their birth dates, because the tangled web becomes rather difficult to decipher. Yes, Kent, because when you start getting batshit crazy with the crap you're presenting, it does become a bit muddled, doesn't it? It's almost as though it just doesn't make sense. Each of these men were working with each other or near each other. Sometimes they were not aware of others working in the same field. Sometimes they were very, very close companions. Oh boy, I'm getting excited. I love a good bullshit conspiracy. The next man we come to is Alfred Russell Wallace. He was born in 1823 and died in 1913. Now, viewer, we've come across Alfred Russell Wallace before. Kent touched on him briefly on a previous page. As we know, he's the guy that almost pipped Darwin to the post of publishing what would effectively have been Origin of the Species by means of natural selection. Although I'm quite sure that Alfred Russell Wallace would have come up with a somewhat shorter and snappier title. How to kill all the darkies, piss on the Bible, and get rid of Jesus in three easy steps. Or something snappy like that. After all, that's what Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace and all the other people that you mentioned stood for, isn't it, Kent? That's what evolution is all about. Nope. Well, I'll let you put it in your own words. You're so much better at it. Kent continues. He was a contemporary of Darwin. He came up with several theories such as the survival of the fittest. This was used by the capitalists in the 1800s to justify the annihilation of anyone who did not fit in. Yes, Kent Curtis, it's not as though like the Bible's ever been used to justify witch hunts and burnings and genocide. I mean, the last one, you'd have to be on some sort of crusade to do something like that. Oh, yeah. Anyway, for instance, Rockefeller, Carnegie, and some of those early tycoons were ruthless in their business practices because they based their business practices on evolution. Really, Kent? I just thought it was kind of common sense. You know, like if there's two businesses, you own one of them, and you undercut your rival, and they go bust, and you're the only one left, then everybody will buy their stuff from you. Simple, really, when you think about it. They said, only the fittest can survive, so we will be the strongest and take over. They were bright lads, them lot, weren't they? That's probably why they were quite successful. I wonder if they paid their tax bill. Hmm. No, they must have done. They didn't go to jail. With Rockefeller's Standard Oil Company, 
The way they used to monopolize the market was by buying out all the stations in a particular town. Any stations that refused to sell were literally driven out of business. For instance, if the price of gasoline was 20 cents a gallon, Rockefeller would instruct his people to sell it for 15 cents a gallon for a few months, just long enough to put the competitor out of business. When the other station would go out of business, he would have a corner on the market and jack his prices back up. Now Kent, you know how you was talking about evolution and communism earlier on? That practice, the practice you've just described just there, carried out by Rockefeller and all his mates, that sounds particularly capitalist to me. But either way, whichever way you look at it, if the station owner wouldn't sell out, at least they didn't tie him to a stake and set fire to him and call him a witch or a heretic. Take your pick. The idea of evolution had its modern beginning with Wallace. Darwin is given credit for it, but Wallace actually published his book first, nearly a year earlier. Actually, Kent, what was published was not a book. What was actually published was a paper. For viewers who, like yourself, Kent, don't know the difference between a book and a paper, a book is, well, a book. However, a paper is like an essay, like a magazine article. It's not a book at all. And what had actually happened is Darwin and Wallace had been working on essentially the same thing completely independently. However, they had met and they were corresponding. And Wallace sent a copy of his paper to Darwin for consideration to, to basically have a look over and see if it was, it was right or not. See if there was, I don't know, any glaring errors. A bit like you should have done with your doctoral dissertation. You know, pass it on to somebody intelligent to have a read-through first. Not just your wife. I mean, we've got to presume she's a fucktard too, because she went to jail for tax fraud, and hey, she married you. But that aside, no. Wallace's intention was not to publish, it was simply to give it to Darwin to peer review. Darwin agreed that, yes, he was on the right lines, but at the time his village was um, suffering a scarlet fever outbreak. In fact, at the time, Darwin's young son died of scarlet fever. What actually happened was Darwin passed it on to Lyle and asked Lyle to decide whether or not it should be published. This was at the request of Wallace, and give him his credit. Darwin did just that. So Wallace's essay was put together with some of Darwin's unpublished works, which emphasised Darwin's priority. After all, Darwin had actually come up with the theory many years before. However, Wallace had only just come up with his theory. And the whole lot was presented to the Linnean Society in London on the 1st of July, 1858. As it turned out, Darwin couldn't attend the presentation himself due to the death of his young son. However, it was a co-presentation. Wallace became one of Darwin's most staunch supporters and admitted that his own work would not have reached the prominence it did had it not have been for Darwin, who was at the time a much more senior and prominent scientific figure. Darwin then published his famous book, one year later. To say that Darwin received credit that should have gone to Wallace is disingenuous, but when did we ever get honesty from a creationist, especially from you? <laughs>